Welcome back. Today we're going to do the normal standard projections of the wrist, in this case the left wrist. Notice the left marker. I just wanted to talk to you about this marker really quick. This type of radiographic marker is called a Mitchell marker. And Mitchell markers have left and right markers as usual. However, they have this extra entity which you see within the center of the L. Now you'll see these little BBs and basically this is to help differentiate whether the film was taken upright or on a table. These BBs are suspended in oil within the Mitchell marker and so when hung, if the person's standing upright for example, the BBs will sink to the bottom, therefore indicating that the film was taken weight-bearing or standing. When we take tabletop films to include extremities usually, um, the BBs will sink to the center because it's sitting on a flat surface. And so these markers can help to indicate to you whether or not the film was taken weight-bearing, which is more important in the spine than in the extremities. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of information on that. So let's get back to the normal structures. Uh, and talk about some of the things that we can see within the wrist. Well, first of all, you can see the radius and ulna. You can also see the carpal bones, which are located in this region, metacarpals, and phalanges. Now, a lot of these structures we did cover in the hand tutorial, but I just wanted to quickly go through this with you. Now, with wrist projections, typically they're taken with the fingers curled under. If you notice here that the fingers are slightly curled, and this is to approximate the carpals to the cassette. With hand projections, the hand is extended out because we need to get the full orientation of the fingers, and so the hand is laid flat but in a hand projection the primary focus is not necessarily the carpal bones whereas the wrist projection the feature of wrist projections is to evaluate the carpals so just a little something to think about if you order hand projections they are not the same as wrist projections so just be aware of the slight differences between those two examinations now just to get back to our anatomy let's start with the radius here is the radial metaphysis and of course the radial epiphysis which it contains the articular surface this is the E go ahead and test yourself good this is the radial styloid how about this over here very good this is the ulnar styloid here's just the distal portion of the ulna and of course the ulnar shaft and radial shaft now let's continue on here here's the radial articular surface the radial articular surface and the ulnar articular surface should be uh, relatively even if the radius articular surface is shorter or more proximal than the, or excuse me, if the ulnar articular surface is shorter than or more proximal than the radial articular surface, we call this negative ulnar variance. Negative ulnar variance does increase the stress upon the lunate and can predispose the patient to lunate avascular necrosis. Not present in this case. If the ulnar articular surface is longer than or distal to the radial articular surface, we call this positive ulnar variance, and this can can actually affect the triangular fibrocartilage cartilage of the wrist. Now to move on to our carpal bones. If you remember well from the hand tutorial, the proximal row has four carpals and the distal row has four carpals. So let's start with the proximal row. Here is the scaphoid. Next is the lunate, followed by the triquetrum and the pisiform. Distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, Hamate. And this is a great example of the hook of the hamate right here. Now, my students like to use a very interesting um, saying to remember the carpals, and it goes something like this. Please don't be offended, but it's useful. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. And this is basically describing the proximal row and the distal row. Some lovers try positions that they can't handle. So if this is useful for you, please use it. If not, don't. The most important thing is to remember that it always starts on the thumb side, proximal row first, followed by the distal row starting on the thumb side. This is helpful for you, for you to remember the carpals. Again, use it. Now the joint spaces between the carpals are just collectively called the intercarpal joint spaces, whereas the joint space between the carpals and the radius is called the radiocarpal joint space. Okay, now let's just continue on with this region, which is the 
carpal metacarpal joint spaces. Again, these are collectively carpal metacarpal joint spaces. Moving on to the metacarpal, which is this region. Here's the first metacarpal, second metacarpal, third, fourth, and fifth. Metacarpals have bases, shafts, and heads. This is their first metacarpal head followed by the shaft followed by the base the metacarpal bases articulate with the carpals making the carpal metacarpal joints now we only see the proximal phalanxes and we really just see the base now the joint space made here between the metacarpal and the phalange is called the metacarpal phalangeal joint. And so this location um, is where fingers are commonly dislocated, for example. Um, but these are the joints in which um, start the fingers. And lastly, here's the region of the triangular fibro cartilage, which is not seen radiographically normally, however, can undergo some calcification and may be seen in that region. Next is the oblique projection. Okay, so here's the medial oblique projection of the wrist, which is the second standard radiographic projection after the PA projection, which we just performed. On this projection, you can see similar structures again in a slightly different orientation what's going to be the hardest part of course is going to be the carpal so let's just focus on that here's the scaphoid remember the scaphoid is the first bone on the thumb side in the proximal row the next bone to come right after the scaphoid is going to be the lunate and here's the lunate and the triquetrum with the pisiform superimposed. Now coming to the distal row, under the thumb is going to be the trapezium. The next bone, lateral, or excuse me, medial to the trapezium is going to be the trapezoid, which is trapped between the between the trapezium and the capitate. And of course the hamate. We don't see the hamate hook very well. So this is going to be the most difficult portion. Now let's just test you a little bit. I want you to identify these joints here. I'll give you a couple seconds. Good. This is the carpal metacarpal joints. What about this joint here between the distal radius and ulna? This is the distal radial ulnar joint. How about identifying this structure? Very good. This is the radial styloid. How about identifying this structure? Very good. The ulnar styloid. What else can I ask you? Well, I can ask you what lives in this area here? The correct answer would be the triangular fibrocartilage of the wrist. Let's identify this structure here. This is the base of the second metacarpal. How about this structure here? This is the head of the third metacarpal. And what about this joint here? This is the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the fifth digit. Let's move on to the lateral projection. So here's the lateral projection of the wrist, and similar to the oblique projections, the carpals are really going to be the challenge here. So let's just go through the carpals. The most important thing to remember with carpals on the lateral projection is that you're not going to see a full carpal without superimposition of other carpals. So I like to start with the proximal row and evaluate the lunate. The lunate is easily identified because it is uh, shaped like a crescent moon on the lateral projection. Let me just switch my color. All right, here is the lunate. And the next best thing to do is identify the bone that sits directly on top of the lunate, which is always going to be the capitate. Now here you can see a portion of the scaphoid. So what's sticking out in front that looks like the little nose of a dog is going to be the scaphoid. We've already identified the capitate as well as the lunate. Now back here you will be able to see a portion of the triquetrum and the triquetrum can undergo small avulsion fractures in which you'll see a little ossicle back here with an avulsion. Now here's the thumb of course. So the bone that lives right under the thumb we know very well is going to be the trapezium. 
and you can actually see the trapezium here the trapezoid we know comes next and we can only see a portion of it now trapezium trapezoid and we've already evaluated for the capitate so the only bone that's left in the pox or excuse me in the distal row is going to be the hamate and those are most of them the pisiform we don't see very well and i suspect that the pisiform is living right here so this will be the most challenging aspect typically in testing situation at our at our institution we really only ask the students to identify maybe the lunate and the capitate maybe the scaphoid and the trapezium just because you can see it so well under the thumb but of course anything's possible so make sure you have a good hold of these carpals um, and just to finish up here I'd like you to identify this joint this is the metacarpal this is the metacarpal Here's the proximal phalanx, which makes this the metacarpal phalangeal joint of the thumb. Here is the another joint, and this joint is between the proximal phalanx and the distal phalanx, which makes this the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. Remember that the thumb only has a proximal and distal phalanx, whereas the rest of the digits 2 through 5 have a proximal middle and distal phalanx and therefore will have a proximal interphalangeal joint and a distal interphalangeal joint. I hope this wrist tutorial was useful for you and please join us for future tutorials.